All right. Welcome, everybody, to Influential Conversations for Accountants podcast slash webinar part three. We record this live, this eight part series live in webinar with a live audience. And we also publish to YouTube and we publish into the podcast. And the purpose of this webinar series is one to have a conversation about how accountants can be more influential in the marketplace. And of course, as a, both a preamble and a companion to our conference coming up in October, which we'll discuss briefly. This webinar is for accounting professionals, CPAs, enrolled agents, bookkeepers, QuickBooks Pro advisors, small business accounting advisors, et cetera, that are looking to improve their firm communication strategy to have more influential conversations with their clients, looking to develop their team through richer and more meaningful conversations, and also looking to improve their personal communication skills so they can bring less anxiety uh, to and from work uh, in and their personal life. So that's the purpose of this uh, podcast series. It's eight monthly episodes. You are listening to episode number number three out of eight. Episode number four will go live May 10th, second Friday of every month until we have our conference in October. Each episode will be 30 to 60 minutes long with myself, Hector Garcia, my brother Carlos, and or special guests like we have today, which we'll discuss who he is briefly. You can watch live in Zoom and the series is 100% free to encourage you to joining us in October in Hollywood, Florida for our conference titled by the same name, Influential Conversations for Accountants. That being said, let's get started. Today's guest is a person I've admired for a very, very long time. His name is Blair Enns. He's an author and an advisor to creative entrepreneurs. He works with advertising firms, marketing firms, and uh, his ethos comes from his very first book called The Win Without Pitching Manifesto, which I have here in my hand. Buy this book in Amazon for $20 to $30 in hardcover. You can also get it in Kindle, and you can also get it in audiobook format, depending on what you prefer. It's got 4.8 uh, stars, over 2,000 reviews, and it's absolutely amazing. We'll talk about it briefly. We'll talk about some of the thinking that has evolved from this book his other books and stuff that's coming up in uh, Blair's world. So there's also another book, uh, which is actually more of like a system. I think calling it a book would actually not be the right thing. It's a system. It's, uh, it's in a clip, um, what's it called? Um, a binder format. And it's really meant for you to use as a transformational tool. It's called pricing creativity, which is a play in two things. One is Creativity is one of the most intangible, difficult things to price. So how to price that and also getting creative with pricing. I'm not sure if, if it was meant like that, but that's how I understood it, which I think is brilliant. And also uh, Blair's blog called The Thinking, a section of, of the Win Without Pitching website. You want to check that out. That's in the slides. And lastly, the podcast, the Two Bobs podcast, subtitled Conversations in the Art of Creative Entrepreneurship, with David C. Baker, another brilliant person in the industry, wrote, I believe, the latest two books. One is called The Business of Expertise, which I absolutely love. Um, and the other one is called The Secret Trade Craft of Elite Advisors. Also an amazing read. So, Blair, did I miscategorize any of your introduction there? No, that was a lot of info, Hector, and you got it all exactly right. Thank you for that. I'm really happy to join you today. Absolutely. So before we get started, Blair, Win Without Pitching Manifesto is uh, an immensely uh, successful book. And I don't know if we, I don't know if you have millions of sales, I doubt it because it's a very niche book, but it's very successful because almost every person that reads this book uh, writes to you, talks about it. Uh, our friend, our mutual friend, Chris Doe, who was in our conference last year, um, was so smitten by the book that he actually did an entire uh, 12 part series in Clubhouse during the, Club during the pandemic, and I believe is this is that has been one of the most significant pieces of of of, of thought leadership that Chris Doe has done in, in combination with you. So first, I'd like to tell us why is Win Without Pitching Manifesto so successful? What in the world is the pitch? And um and give us a little insight into your world. Yeah, thanks. Um, why is it successful? So so far, it's um, within the next few months, it will hit one hundred thousand copies, which is which is 
it's pretty good for a niche book. It's kind of, it's, it's gone beyond the niche it was written for. That's, you know, one of the reasons why I'm here speaking to account accountants, not for the first time. Um, why is it successful? Uh, so it, the, the, the pitch, so everybody knows what a sales pitch is, right? And um, you go into a meeting with a prospective client. I venture to guess that you go into pitch mode where you are transmitting and not receiving. That is, uh, that problem is even, um, it's orders of magnitude greater. I mean, if you could measure it objectively in creative firms, because in a creative firm, like when, what I mean by that is an advertising agency or a design firm. And these are the firms that I grew up in professionally. In these firms, you are conditioned to actually give the product away for free. Give your, solve your problem, solve the problem, solve the creative problem as proof of your ability to solve the problem. So the cost of sale in a creative firm is very high. And this idea of pitching for free, we won't get into the history of wh where it came from and, and why it continues to uh, prevail. Um, but I think when I came along in 2010 and published the manifesto, nobody really believed, nobody in this market of ad agencies in particular, and also some design firms, nobody really believed that you could actually secure a, a new account, win the business without having to solve the problem as proof of your ability to solve the problem. The manifesto is really a yes, you can book. It's, it's written to be an inspirational book. Um, it's got 12 chapters, each of them a proclamation that we'll get into, I'm sure. And it was really, there's very little here's how to in the book. I mean, there's, there's a bit of it, but I was really, I really wrote that book. I was trying to incite a revolution. Um, and I think I was somewhat successful. I, well, I, I'm happy. I'm happy with the impact it's had on on the business because a lot has changed in the four. Is it 14 years? I'm horrible at math. Um, a lot has changed in the 14 years or so since that book has come out. What hasn't changed is annual sales keep increasing every year. So it started out slowly, and it just keeps steadily building. So year 14 or year 13 of sales eclipsed every other previous year and it's just a curve that just keeps going upward so it's saying that there's a there's still a need for this thinking in the marketplace uh, this book is like fine wine <laughs> it gets better over time so um you're saying there's not a lot of how to which is what most people look for like how do i solve this problem how do i change my practice how do i um you know behave differently what words do i say you know how do i re how do i respond to 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 the clients, um, you know, complaints or scope creep or whatever. Like a, a lot of us are looking for the how to, but the book fundamentally looks into what should your strategy be. Like how should you think of yourself in terms of creating standards of work. So these standards of work that you impose on yourself, and what I mean by yourself, I just don't mean yourself the individual, but yourself, your firm, right? You're gonna have standards of work. And these standards of work are essentially going to present themselves on the quality of the work. And then the quality of the work eventually will speak for itself. So instead of you having to sell yourself and do all this extra work around selling yourself, like pitching, right? The quality of your work speaks volumes about what you do. And then you start attracting customers. You start pulling customers towards you instead of you trying to push your idea onto them. So that's how I that's how I see it. And I'll briefly go through the 12 proclamations. And if you're an accounting professional, you're watching and, and listening to this. This is actually written in such a way that it's not industry specific. Like you actually go through these 12 proclamations and you think about your practice, your business, or yourself if you're an individual, and you think, huh, what if I had those proclamations? What if I said that out loud? And what if I acted as if every single one of these things were the absolute truth about how I should manage my business? So I'll pick uh, Blair's brain about maybe two or three of them, but these are the proclamations. We will specialize. We will replace conversation. We will replace presentations with conversations. We will diagnose before we prescribe. Hat tip to the medical industry there. 
We will rethink what it means to sell. We will do with words what we used to do with paper. We will be selective. We will build expertise rapidly. We will solve problems before we are paid. We will address issues of money early. We will refuse to work at a loss. We will charge more. We will hold our heads up high. These are the 12 proclamations, 12 things that you need to say. And if you do say them and you believe them and you act upon them, your business could be transformed. So Blair, maybe break down two or three of those for us. Well, the foundational one is the first one, the first proclamation of we will specialize. And when I wrote that book in 2010, there was still kind of a dearth of specialism going on in the creative firms, in the creative industry. There's a reason for that, but it's not, it's, it's, um, it's not specific to the creative industry, but creativity is effectively the ability to see. It's not the ability to write or draw, um, at least based on the definition that I'm using that, that was um, written by a scholar on creativity. Um, so if you think of this, it's the ability to bring a novel perspective to a problem then if that's your superpower, thinking about a problem differently, then you will be drawn to problems that you have not previously solved. So your personal superpower and your personal interest aligns to this need for variety. You're always drawn to a problem you haven't previously solved, and it conflicts with your business's need for you to focus. Or, because everybody understands that you know broad expertise is an oxymoron, and if you want to get deeper, if you want to deepen your knowledge on something, you want to become more expert on something, the most practical way to do it, and effectively the only real way to do it, unless you're like a genius polymath, um, the only way to do it is to narrow your focus. You narrow the set of problems that you are staring at every day that you're solving, and you start to see the patterns. You go deeper and deeper into that. So it starts with specialization. So if you take, and I don't profess to know the accounting profession well, but I do for the last few years, I've thought I should buy an accounting firm because we, we, I work with accountants um, in our business. I'm in Canada. <clears throat> we work worldwide. Most, the majority of our business is in the U S so we have American accountants and Canadian accountants and have worked with multiple accountants. And I'm just struck by how um, poorly positioned they are and how, how they, how they price it drives me crazy how they price, but we can come back to that. Um, so if you're a generalist, if you're just a, you hang out your shingle and you say CPA, um, you've got an accounting problem, we can solve it for you. A lot of it might just be tax returns. Some of it might be a lot more specialized than that. Then just think of the number of competitors that you have. You have all kinds of different competitors. And it's not until you narrow your focus and you start to specialize in something, it might be accounting for small business owners. And we, we need to come back to this because it's a bit of a be big topic. And there is a danger in specializing too early, too early in your career. But at some point, um, it makes to narrow, narrow your focus. And I would say, I just finished writing a piece on this. It is, hasn't been published yet. And I haven't decided whether I'm going to publish it or not. But one, it's I'm basically saying to my market, creative people, but I also identify accountants, financial planners, and engineers. I say, design is now too expensive. Accounting is now too expensive. If you define what you do by your discipline, if you say, I am an accountant, I am a designer, then you are in competition with offshore labor and AI. And you're in a race to the bottom. What you do is going to zero. AI can already do most tax returns. It's in a race to the bottom. But if you take that discipline, you have this accounting discipline, this accounting skill certification, so that's a discipline, and you apply it to a more narrow set of problems, prob either narrow the problem set or narrow the market, the, the organizations, people or organizations for whom you solve those problems, or a combination of both, now you can start to use AI, you can even start to use offshore labor, you can use these tools that are commodifying your discipline to your advantage, and you can start to create real value and, and charge a lot more money. So that's kind of a modern update on this idea of we will specialize. If you are 
if you define what you do by your discipline, I am an accountant rather than I'm somebody who solves these types of problems and I happen to be an accountant and there are accountant accounting components that we will take care of, then, um, then you're in trouble. And I think, you, you know, you, you and I can have a conversation about this Hector and people can post questions or comment on that. Uh, if anybody wants to push back on it, but that's kind of a modern update on the first proclamation of we will specialize. And if you don't gain an advantage, change the power dynamics in the buy sell relationship by vastly reducing the number of direct competitors through specialization. If you don't do that, then all of the 11 subsequent proclamations, they're a lot harder to do. That's a that's a great point. And I want to give you some insight into, and I know you heard from every industry reply back, but Blair, you don't understand our industry is different. Like everybody has the same answer. So I'm going, I'm going to put the, you don't understand our industry is different hat for a second, just to tell you what our challenge is. Okay. Our challenge is our entire industry has chosen not to be specialists. So Customers are accustomed to the CPAs that do everything. They're accustomed to, hey, can you do my personal tax return? Yes. Can you do my S Corp or my, my business? Yes. Can you do my brother's uh, little company? Yes. Can you do my church's return? Yes. Can you do my grand grandfather's state tax return? Yes. The challenge that we've had is that we've created an environment where we is our brand, accountants, CPAs, uh, bookkeepers. We want our client to trust us for everything related to money, accounting, and tax because we felt that that was the way to have the most amount of opportunities and the most amount of business. And the only way to grow our business really was to say yes to as many people um, that have a checkbook as possible. Now, you're proposing to us something that many thought leaders in our industries, in conferences, in podcasts, is proposing to us, which is pick a specialty, specialize, and the riches are in the niches, et cetera, et cetera. However, for a lot of us, it's difficult to figure out how to exactly, how to get started with that exactly with a firm that already manages and does multiple things, with already a lifestyle where we draw satisfaction from the fun of solving a brand new problem that we've never seen before. In the horizon, we see two potential problems. One is we don't know how to go from broad to narrow in our existing firms. And two, we're worried about getting bored. <laughs> so those two things are happening at the same time. Even if we intellectually understand that there's more profitability in the end, and we all do, and, and accountants, we understand profitability more than anyone else. Even when we, when we accept that, we have trouble getting the kickstart because of those two issues. So you mind addressing them? Yeah, none at all. So um, it's not a requirement to specialize. You just, so if you're not specialized, you, you have a, you have a sales and marketing problem, right? You have a new client problem. If you don't have a new client problem, then there's no problem to solve, right? You're fine. And one thing about accounting is I imagine it's like financial planning in that it's a, it's a, you're in, it's a relationship business. Once you are in the relationship, those a lot of those relationships go on for a very long time. So the bigger threat to those relationships is actually the cost of your services going down through offshore labor and AI. But in terms of attracting new clients, if you don't have a problem, then you don't have to specialize. It's not the goal is not to specialize as narrow as possible. It's to be positioned as as broadly as practical. So how tight do you need to get to be differentiated so that you can build your practice? If the people who are listening to and watching this, if they've already built a substantial practice um, and their focus isn't on growing the practice through the acquisition of new clients, then they don't really have to worry about it, at least in the short term. They do have to keep an eye on the cost of their services, some of the key services going to zero. That's that's the looming threat. Um, boredom, yeah, creative people have the same same issue with boredom. I'll, so, and it's also not specializing is not about saying no to everything. It's really about the work that you pursue and that you're trying to attract. 
in a relationship oriented business, let's say, I'll give you an example. So I live in a small town in the middle of nowhere in remote mountain village in Canada. Like it's not even a town, it's a village, less than a thousand people. The woman who cuts my hair here, um, she used to live in the big city of 10,000 people an hour away. And when I talked to her about what I do and we talked about specialization, she told me the story of when she launched her um, hairstylist practice, she advertised herself as specializing in curly hair. And she said she was immediately swamped. She just filled all of her capacity immediately because I've never seen a hairstylist claim to specialize in a certain type of hair. Um, and my wife has curly hair and she goes to her, et cetera. But what happens is the initial influx of business, she's differentiated herself in the market, uh, allows her to build a practice early, but then all of the referrals happen. All of these relatives and friends who don't have curly hair look at the value proposition and go, well, if you can cut curly hair, you can cut straight hair. So at some point when she was at capacity, which was pretty quick, she dropped the claim of specialization. And I have another example of that in the financial services space. And these are both kind of relationship oriented businesses that strike me as similar to accounting firms. So if you're just long, if you're young in your business or early in the business, or you do have a, a, a growth problem, a lack of growth through a lack of new clients, try putting out their accounting firm and then in smaller type specializing in X. Now, if you're doing marketing, now you know, who, now you have a, a distinct marketing message. Um, so that's how I would have you think about it. I also think about Google searches. Like if, what are the probabilities, let's say you're in LA, what are the probabilities that somebody goes to Google and types CPA in LA, right? And they'll find you. If you actually, understand a little bit about SEO and the way you game the whole search engine world, it would probably cost you half a million dollars over a lifetime of work to get to the point where somebody searches CPA in LA and you show up. Where if if somebody, and, and, and by the way, on top of that, let's say you show up and, so, and a bunch of other people show up, all these top five are also competing with price because people are calling all five to quote the price because there's many of them. But if they search CPA in LA for Japanese expats slash double taxation issues, right? They're only going to find the one person that decided to specialize on that, to make their entire website about that, to write blog articles about that. The social media is called the, the, Jap expat CPA or whatever, like they, they, they build an entire brand around that. And yes, you will have a lot less clients, but it's possible and, 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 and extremely realistic that the less clients you get can pay more than the broad clients that you're taking because um, a Japanese expat with double taxation problems, talking to the one person that specializes on that is more willing to pay $10,000 to just get it done right by the expert than gamble with somebody else. And I think uh, what some of, the, some of the things that people do with non-specializers is they make a mental calculation in their head that goes, if I go with a non-specialist, then I have to make up the risk I'm taking with price. But when I go with a specialist, I'll pay more for taking less risk. So the specialist, de-risks the transaction. And that's the part, the part that doesn't get discussed enough. And this is one of these squishy mental calculations that customers make that they might not necessarily say out loud, but it does happen through their decision making. So there's an inherent price premium that you will be searching by being the one and only that people were able to find as the expert about that. Yeah, and you, you shouldn't even try to strive for one and only. I think if you if it's a market of one, then you're probably too tight. Um, but I, you redu vastly reduce the number of direct competitors. You think you use the word price premium a couple of times. You think about the definition of the word premium. It's got it's got two definitions. <clears throat> one is an amount above an ordinary or a standard price. That's a premium. <clears throat> and another definition is. 
it's the it's the it's the uh, amount you pay monthly on your insurance policy right they're the same thing so just think about this you pay a price premium as a form of insurance so almost 20 years ago when i needed to find a cross border accountant who dealt with canadian and us taxation and i searched google there was really only one person who came up and we still use that person so that you know to, to illustrate your point yeah price premium pay, people pay more <clears throat> for the insurance the likely because i could hire a generalist to do this stuff that hasn't done it before most of them wouldn't take it but imagine imagine the the expert who said uh, i've never done that before but yeah i'll i'll do it I, many years ago when i moved to this small village we had one doctor his name was doc olson believe it or not old doc olson and uh I went to him, I had a kidney stone, and I said, I also need a vasectomy. And um, can you refer me to a urologist? And he said, yeah, I will refer you. And he said, you know, I used to do these. I could probably do it. And then he said, no, nah, I probably shouldn't. And then he said, no, I could probably do it. And it's just a matter <laughs> just the confidence that he did not instill in me, even though he was seasoned head, it wasn't the thing that he did every time. My wife just came back from a dental specialist, a consultation and for a procedure that is probably going to be a little bit painful. And the guy said, I do 500 of these a year. Okay. You're the person from, you do this procedure 500 times a year. I will pay. And then she did the, the math on the price and how much money this guy, this is a dentist making well over a million dollars a year. So that's price premium. She pays the premium because she wants the person who's going to get it done right. Right. And he built and, a fancy new house as a result. And we can accept the premise that doing 500 of those specific things, it's probably more boring than doing a whole bunch of new different cases. But also- Not boring by, spending that money though. Yeah, exactly. That's the point I want to make. But 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 also uh, what's not boring is getting getting better at it every single time to you being the one that other professionals good look after to kind of like mentor them and help them. And you become a leader, a thought leader in the profession, being recognized as best in class in that, in, in that area. And also when you're best in class in something and something innovative is happening in that world and they need a consultant or a face or a partner, they're going to say, you know what? We're building this new machine that does that procedure in half the time. And who best to partner with that the one person that has done it 500 times. So you, you also want to think about your evolution as a professional, you know, like, do you want to retire or die doing the same thing you're doing now? No, but the best way to evolve is to stand out. And, and the best way to stand out is to be best in class. And the only way to be best in class is to build as, as you have it here on, I believe is. Uh, number seven, build expertise rapidly. And you kind of have to do the same thing over and over, like the 10,000 hour rule, right? I forgot that was Malcolm Glaxwell, that you, know, you have to do something 10,000 hours to become an expert at it. Yeah. And this fear of boredom, we need to speak about it because it is grossly overstated. It's been proven repeatedly across numerous studies. Human beings are horrible predictors of what they will and will not like. So you think of... so. Uh, this here's the metaphor that I use. You're standing in a room full of doors, and I did this with Chris Doe on one of his podcasts. And being a being a generalist, you want to walk through every door. Every door represents a different problem with a different type of client. And I'm standing behind you, and I'm saying, "No, you need to pick one door, walk through it, and never look back." And you think on the other side of one door is you will die from boredom, because you think if you can only spend the rest of your professional your career in that one room, it's just say, solving the same problem over and over again. It's going to bore the hell out of you. But that's not what's on the other side of that door. What's on the other side of that door is more doors. You just can't see them from where you are. So this guy who does 500 procedures a year, I'll bet you in some ways they're all similar. And then there are these outliers that really push him and deepen are the source of him deepening his expertise. And I'll bet the problems are fascinating and he runs up against the edge of his skill set into this zone, into kind of the zone known as the flow state where 
Well, I'm challenged, but I feel competent. I feel like I'm at the height of my abilities. That's the, that, that flow state. That's what we all kind of seek in everything that we do. And yeah, if you're doing the same thing over and over again, repetitive tasks, you don't get to that flow state. If you're always doing something new you haven't done before, you're seriously stressing yourself. You don't get to that flow state. You do get to know. it. You do get to it as an expert who's kind of pushing the boundaries of your expertise, getting deeper and deeper. I think Carlos has joined us. Yeah, Carlos joined. Carlos actually in uh, in Europe, so he says I'm gonna sneak in. He probably forgot to unmute when he logged in. Absolutely, Blair. And I will we'll end this conversation with. Uh, there's a story I want to tell you. It's very, very, very quick. I've told this before. People may have heard me discussing this before. Um, my friend came to my house the other day and he opened the sliding door and he heard all sorts of squeaks. And he said, oh man, you got to call my, my, my sliding door guy. He's great. Now, when he said that, I, I heard handyman. I, I mean, I, I didn't hear sliding door guy. Like I, it wouldn't occur to me that there isn't a thing as a sliding door guy. So I called, you know, I, I call Juan and I say, hey, man, I have an issue with uh, Mauricio told me to call you. I have an issue with my sliding door. Can you fix it? He's like, all right, most of the problems can be can be fixed for one hundred and seventy five dollars. I have a lot of the parts with me. Uh, once I get there, I let you know if there'll be more. Are you OK with that? I, 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 he was addressing the issue with money early on, almost like, listen, I don't even want to talk to you if you don't think one hundred and seventy five bucks will work. And I was like, uh, OK, fine. Uh, and then so he comes in. He looks at the sliding door and he said, yeah, I'll get it done for you. Um, uh, here, here's my Zelle, pay me 175 bucks or whatever. And I just had to pay him right there. And then I just kind of trusted him really. So he went in there, he took the, the door out, replaced the wheels, put the, put the door back in. The sliding door was like, it was just so satisfying to finally get my sliding door back without the squeaks. And the guy goes, try it. And I go, amazing. And, and, and in that moment, I said, this is the best handyman I've ever seen in my entire life. The guy comes with equipment. He's ready. Um, he told me the price up front. He fixed it in like literally, I'm not lying to you, nine minutes. And I said, hey, man, I, I'm definitely going to use you. I, I need help with this. I need help with this. He's like, I only fix sliding doors. And I was like, wait, you make a living just fixing sliding doors? He's like, yeah. He's like, okay, tell me a little That's bit about amazing. that. That's amazing. That's amazing. He tells me, I tell him, tell me a little bit about that. And the guy shows me his calendar and he had 17 more sliding doors to fix that day. So in the day, in the day because he got the, he was already like wrapping up and, and, and leaving. Like that's all he does is a sliding door guy. And that's it. And I got to tell you, every time a friend comes over and they're checking out my house, I go, the first thing I want you to try that sliding door. Like I, I show off the sliding door and I'm so proud. And I have, I have referred Juan, the sliding door guy to every single person that I know. And I've never referred any of my other uh, handymans that I ever had, because that to me was just so amazing. And that's how you stand out. Like we gotta be the sliding door guy of our industry and, and, and charge 175 five bucks for nine minutes worth of work. And next now that's a bit, in direct contrast of the whole relationship concept, of course, Juan wasn't trying to build a relationship with me. He has a relationship with sliding doors. He has a relationship with his craft. He has a relationship with probably every single day he wakes up, he goes, I'm going to do it under eight minutes. I'm going to do it under seven minutes. So I'm sure he figured out a way to keep himself excited about doing the same thing, but doing it so damn well that customers are just impressed by what he does. I, so the entire audience being accountants has already done the math on uh, 17 times 175. What I really like about what he did is once he diagnosed it, yeah, okay, it's, he didn't even tell you what the problem is. I can fix He's already told you most, most of these things cost $175. You say, okay, he diagnoses it. It's the same problem that comes up almost probably 90% of the time. And he's got all the different wheels in the van. He says, I can fix it. It's 175 bucks. You pay him. He's done in 10 minutes. So he's eliminated the conversation where after 10 minutes, he says, hey, it's a 175 bucks. And you say, what? It only took you 10 minutes. Good for him for getting the money up front. That's fantastic. Right. I, 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 as a value pricing guy, of course, I didn't challenge the whole pricing premise, but I could totally see myself 10 years ago without understanding value pricing and completely going bonkers about 
you're paying 175 bucks for the for the 10 minutes. The point is that all he really and, and you really think if you look at the work, all he did was remove the door, clean clean the guide, and replace the wheels. This is like what five five to ten dollars worth of materials. The value was knowing how to do it, knowing how to do it quickly, saying it with confidence, having a fixed price, and being recommended by someone else that says, you got to call my sliding door guy. That is the brand. I mean, it, it maybe that happened by accident, but that is the brand. The brand is, I, I will get your sliding door fixed and you will be blown away. And he, he, he never presented it that way. That, that way. Yeah. It happened through the word of mouth. Yeah, that's incredible. What a, I'm going to use that story. If I may, I'll attribute it to you. No problem. And so we'll move on um, uh, from that. And I wanted to ask you, Blair, so we'll write a, 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 a manifesto for us, uh, for your firm, for you individually. You use the, we'll use your book as inspiration. Maybe we'll bastardize all 12 of them and, and, and just kind of reword it. Maybe we'll grab two or three that we like. Once the, the, the manifesto is written and we have convinced ourselves and we have convinced our team, is there a public version of this? Like, how do how do we let, now let the world know that we work under these standards and these minimums and like how do we externalize this? Yeah, so it it in my world it starts with the point of view. You have to articulate a a point of view or a perspective. So you do you we can we can describe your um your focus as your discipline for a certain market. So what do you do and who do you do it for? And then you look at who else has the same discipline in market accounting for anybody who needs accounting. Um, there are a lot of competitors. <clears throat> and so the first way to set yourself apart is through um, narrowing that focus, either the discipline or the market more correctly, like focus on a specific set of problems for a specific uh, client type. And then the second level of differentiate. So now you've eliminated now, instead of a, a thousand direct competitors, maybe you have 20 direct competitors in your, in your geographical market. Um, now, how do you further differentiate yourself from those 20? Well, it's through your perspective, your point of view, your overarching belief on how this discipline for market should be done. So once you arrive at a perspective and I'm fortunate, I, I tripped over one, it's right there in the name of the business in the book, this idea that you can win business without having to pitch for free. So that's the perspective, then write a manifesto on it. And the manifesto doesn't have to be a 24,000 word book. Um, it can be a 450 word blog post. And then once you write the manifesto, you nail it to the church door, the way Martin Luther nailed the 96 theses of the Protestant uh, Reformation. Um, so what does that mean? That means put it on your website somewhere prominently and link to it and reference it from time to time. Um, and I think that's enough for most people. And for some, for, for some people, some firms, maybe the manifesto is there's a, maybe there's enough there to write a book. Maybe it's just a blog post. Maybe it's a YouTube video, whatever it is, just get it out into the public. And the other work that you're doing, if you're, if you're creating any thought leadership, if you're putting any information out there in the world for uh, 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 to draw people to you, then link back to that manifesto. And what you're trying to do here with that perspective and the articulation of that perspective in the manifesto is you're trying to um, attract clients who are ideologically aligned. So in my primary target market of creative firms, if you don't think free pitching is a problem, then you're you're not going to be drawn to us. Um, if you think free pitching is a problem and nothing can be done about it, or you, for whatever reason, you can't change your ways, you're not going to be drawn to it. So your perspective should be somewhat polarizing. It's not fair to say it should be like really polarizing. Pol the need for polarization, I'm fond of saying, is a function of competition density. So if you're undifferentiated and you've got all kinds of direct competitors and there aren't enough customers and it's a bloodbath fighting for those potential clients, then you need to be somewhat polarizing in your perspective. And I, off the top of my head, I can't think of what a, what a perspective um, for an accountant would be. I know my financial advisor... I don't know that he would articulate this, but I think of his point, his ideology is 
uh, paying any tax is criminal. <laughs> He's offended if I or any of his clients pay taxes. And he's not advocating uh, that we do anything illegal. He's just into all kinds of elaborate structures to get your tax bill to zero. So I would say that's kind of his ideology. Now, I would just ask the listener, do you have a point of view that you think sets you apart from most other accountants who also do what you do serving the market that you serve? You're muted, Hector. I want to share it with something with you briefly, briefly there. Um, I think it wasn't a direct inspiration, but I believe you had a lot of influence on this. A couple of years ago, I got tired of answering the question. I need a CPA. Uh, how much do you charge? Like, I just felt it was just a lot of waste of time for both sides. So what I did is I wrote an open, I said, open letter to new clients. I published it on LinkedIn. I have it on my website. When anybody asks me the questions, I say, I'm going to say, hey, Read the open letter first, then we'll talk. On the open letter, I I I I say why not CPA accounting services are the same. The fact that I only do a few of them and not all of them. The fact that you have to pay a diagnosis fee up front just to have the initial conversation and for us to know, for them to know, for us to know what we can do for them. The fact that we have a specific niche, which is QuickBooks related inventory, e-commerce, and manufacturing. Uh, workflows. That's the, the spe speciality, spe specialization that I have, the type of work that we typically do, the type of work that we that we normally don't do, and addressing the concept of why I'm not going to give them an hourly rate. So I, I think you had a lot of influence on that, and, it, and, and that completely transformed and changed how I felt about having that conversation up front. Instead of having to sell on the idea that hey, you, you got to pay me for a diagnostic. And then they'll go, why do I have to pay for a diagnostic if nobody else does? I go, just read the open letter and then get back to me. And I believe that one, the level of confidence that you exude by doing that, uh, it's really valuable. Number two, it gives the client homework. I've done my homework. I spent the past 25 years becoming the best at what I do. Do some homework client and figure out if you want to work with me. So I want to thank you and, and, and Ron Baker and many of the people that I've followed over the years to, for giving me the confidence to doing something like that. And, uh, and, and, and the reason why I'm saying that is because maybe it doesn't look like 12 bullet points in your website that says, these are my proclamations. Maybe it, it just simply just looks like this. Hey, Mr. Customer, you want to work with us? This is what we do. This is how we do it. This is a process. This is the entry fee. And this is likely what you'll get out of out of just the initial conversation, even if we don't work together and make people go through the exercise of learning that first. I don't have a book, so I can't be like you, Blair, where you say, I really won't talk to you if you haven't read my book yet. Okay, And I, and I get that position because your book is who you are. It, it's, it's, it's your thinking. And, and, and it's, it's, it's much easier to have a conversation about what you can do for them after they've gone through the the basic elements of your book because the conversation is much more advanced conversation. Just like I don't take any more clients. I haven't seen one of my YouTube videos. Why? Because it, it would be such a waste of time for me to like sell myself and who I am and what I'm good at. Okay. Before having somebody already see it firsthand by watching my video. So the, 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 the point is the manifesto doesn't look exactly like the way you have it laid out in the book. It's just basically setting the rules of engagement. I love it. Absolutely love it. It does all the heavy lifting. And for your open letter, my book, and that book in particular, um, there's just a marked difference between somebody who reaches out to you who has been exposed to your thinking, your point of view, and somebody who has not, right? So I can imagine that you get inquiries from people, hey, email me your rates. I'm looking for an accountant. And you probably go, oh, not another one of these. And you send them back and say, read this. And if uh, if you want to talk after that, let me know. And it's this separator. It does a lot of the heavy work, your philosophy, your specialism, all of these things. And it's the same with me. Every once in a while, we get some, I haven't had it in a while because that book's been out for 14 years and I have a, a, other books and podcasts for seven years, et cetera. Um, but every once in a while, I get like somebody who's like, "Hey, we're 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 looking for uh, a consultant. You're one of three. Um, 
can you respond to this RFP? S something silly like that. And it's clear that they just, I'm just a name on a list and um, they don't actually know anything about us. That's awesome. Yeah, absolutely right. We're, we, we're aligned there. Question, 12 proclamations and win without pitching. Again, amazing framework for building a specialized practice. Is there a 13th proclamation? It's been 14 years. It's been what, 14 years you said? Is there is there something, like if you could go back and add a 13th item, would you add one? Yeah, I don't think I would. First of all, I don't know which, I would keep it at 12. I don't know which one I would take away. I'm, it's a, I really like the question, but I, um, I'm surprised at how much I still like that book 14 years later. Uh, one of the things we've already spoken to this, there there isn't a lot of here's how to. So the books that I'm writing now, Pricing Creativity, is really the here's how to follow up for the the money proclamations, eight through 12, really, eight through 11, really, um, where we talk about it's, it's really about money getting paid uh, loosely about pricing. Um, so that's a, that's a, here's how to, and as you say, it's kind of a working book. It's a, it's a manual meant to, it's in that form because I want you to have it on your shelf and I want you to pull it off from time to time and reference it. And the book that I'm, uh, I finished now and is out in September and I, I won't say the name of it yet. Um, but it is really the, here's how to follow up to the manifesto. It's written in the same tone of voice um but it's quite detailed it gives away our entire model for selling um so what you do when how you hold yourself what tools you use and includes some guidance on pricing as well so i, I is there 13 proclamation no but it would be the 13th proclamation is everything i've done that comes after that book i guess here's how to yeah, so a couple of things I want to uh, add. Um, in, in the conversation we had prior to hit and record, uh, you told me the same thing. I won't tell you the name of the book, but the general theme was that that we, the professionals, we are two, we are two avatars. We are the expert, the technical expert at the particular thing that we have trained all of our lives for, and then there's the our branding selves, the salesperson inside of us that is um, promoting that craft. And some firms have that completely separated. They got the salespeople and the branding people and they have the, the production people and the experts. But I believe that in accounting, so much of us are both the ones selling the firm, selling the services and then doing them. So I believe that much you can give away that that's the theme of the book is the separation between you know, our expert self and our salesperson self. Yeah. So we're, the first two books were written for the creative individual in the uh, creative firm. They have found much, much broader audiences. And this third book um, is written for that broader audience. So it would include accountants. It's anybody who sees themselves as an expert advisor or practitioner first and a salesperson second. So if your second job is selling, if you have to sell to be able to do what you love to do, your core profession, um, then this book is for you because most people who who's, whose second job is sales uh, generally don't like it, don't think they're very good at it. And so this book is written for those people. And, and and you're alluding to um, this idea of the expert you versus salesperson you. There's a post I wrote. You can find it on winwithoutpitching.com. I think it's called The Dichotomy of the Expert Salesperson. And David Baker and I did a pod, two Bob's podcast recording on it by the same title, where I say, you know, there's this, here are all the attributes of expert you. Here's how you show up in the sale. You're kind of, you're disciplined, you're, um, you're, uh, empathetic, you're, you're listening, you're listening to the client, you're all of these great, you could just list all of the qualities of an expert. You just think of your, your relationship with your doctor or your, or your lawyer, how they behave. You have those same attributes in the engagement. Now list the attributes of salesperson you. Do you show up the same way? And really the list, and I, I list attributes of both versions of you, 
in this uh, blog post I just referenced, they're almost mirror opposites. So like, why is that? Why have some of you have been trained that way, but mostly you've intuited that this is how you should sell because this is how you yourself have been sold. And the big message in the book is lose salesperson you, lose them all together. We, we have a model that allows expert you to show up the way expert you should show up and sell the way, a way in a way that's intuitive to experts where you don't have to step out of expert you and become salesperson you, where you go into convince mode, you try to talk people into things, you're like trying to prove yourself, et cetera. You can drop all of that. You have to know what to do instead, but that's what that book's about. It's really about that. It's really for the expert who has to sell, doesn't really like it or doesn't think they're good at it or is struggling with it. Um, and we, I think the goal of the book is to free them of this idea that you have to be this other version of you. You don't. I love that. And I promised my audience that as soon as that book comes out, well, first of all, I'll, I'll, I'll buy it and read it and then try to get Blair back on to, to do a deep dive on that and maybe figure out if, is there a, is there an accounting firm speci is, is specialized adaptation to the teachings of that book? So we'll have the discussion later on. So uh, with the time that we have left, I wanted to discuss Pricing Creativity book for a second, just some of the lessons that we've learned from it. So you say that this is the, the how-to, um, or your first iteration of a how-to for creative professionals on how to price. And there's there's two concepts I want to discuss. I want to discuss the holistic concept. Let's call it the mindset concept. And let's talk about, and the, the other concept is the mechanics. So the holistic concept that you have is, that the power of the sale is a function of desire. And you have this formula, which is P equals DB divided by D. And then I'll, 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 I'll have you quickly define that. And then maybe give us one technique for pricing or crafting options and setting up the uh, low offer and the high offer. Sure. So P equals DB over D. I wish I had a win without pitching coffee cup here because we printed on the back of the coffee cup. <laughs> It stands for your power in the sale, P for power, is a function of your desirability, DB, being greater than your desire. So uh, your desirability, how badly the client wants or needs to work with you or an engagement with you versus your uh, desire for the client, how badly you need it. Otherwise stated, whoever wants it the most has the least power in the buy-sell relationship. I, I got a phone call from a, or a FaceTime from a friend two days ago. She was lying on the carpet, just had this gut punch from this deal that did not happen. She was just like, she was like, she just kept saying gut punch and she was just lying down FaceTiming me from the floor. And um, it's just a deal that didn't happen. It was a big deal, but the, what was the problem? She was so emotionally invested in the outcome. And when it didn't happen, she was just absolutely devastated. Now, do you think you can behave like expert you in that moment no you go into salesperson you you go into convince mode you 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 become a version of yourself that you don't actually like because you want it so bad so we just have to pay attention to the power dynamics and are we behaving ask ourselves are we behaving like a needy vendor or are we behaving like kind of this this vaunted expert um, and you don't want to overplay that idea, but let's not show up as needy vendors who go into convince mode. And there was a second part you'd asked me, Hector. Se second part is when crafting pricing options, we talked about giving people three choices. Uh, usually, usually people have a very tough time coming up with the low and the high option. Once the low and the high are set, I think the middle is pretty easy to build. I think some people start by building the middle option and then figuring out what the low and the high is. Do you have any quick three minute version of like, how do we think about the low, the high and the middle when it comes to crafting a price, uh, price set options? The high, set the high first. So you're in a conversation with a client about here's what my needs are. What is it going to look like? You say, well, it could be as high as X and then stop. And it X should be a number that scares even you. And a little bit of silence is good. And when the client goes, there's no way, then you can say, okay, like that, that's on the high end. And that's a really, you can get into comprehensive example why it's so high. Um, 
you get, you can say we have pack you can, if you're packaging up your services you can say packages start at y the low end of the spectrum and then what i so i don't think this applies in an accounting profession like in a creative in a creative firm you would ask the client uh was there a budget you were hoping that i could hit is there a number that you wanted me to try to work with so let's say I anchor at a hundred thousand dollars and the client chokes. Um, and I, let's say they walk a hundred thousand dollars. There's no way I'd pay a hundred for that. Well, if we could deliver these outcomes, what would you pay? Let's say they say, well, maybe, maybe at the most 50. Okay. 50. So, uh, okay. I can work with that. Now on the low end, was there a number that you were, you said you didn't have a budget, but was there a number you, you were hoping to hit? Yeah, I was hoping to spend 10,000 or less. Okay, so now we have a range between 10 and 50. I'll go away and I'll come back with some solutions and um, they'll be priced in that range of 50 on the high end and 10 on the low end. So generally you can either use the client's stated budget as a low end and say, well, here's what we can do for this. Or you can set the low end of the range with your kind of standard base package. And that's probably more applicable for this audience. Yeah. And I think the, the way I would, I would quickly apply it is uh, sometimes we think of our services as just one solution. Like the only solution is to prepare a tax return. So we already have a predetermined amount of uh, time, resources, whatever that it takes our firm to do it. So we have a, a target pricing range ourselves for that. But if, if you, you can get a little bit more creative and go, well, you know, maybe I'm not doing your tax return. Maybe I'm just talking about the tax return that you can do on your own. Maybe I'm giving you a lesson on how taxes work. Maybe I'm just laying out a strategy. Maybe I'm doing the tax return and adding a guarantee that if you get audited, it will include the audit. So, so the, the reality is, I think most of the time we are we are so mired and, 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 and focused on the services that we have provided before that, that when we think of pricing, we're like, okay, this is not very elastic. How would we take a client's price range and back into it? And I think what you're trying to tell us is, hey, if you back, if you first understand and present the enormity of the problem, and then you and the client acknowledges what the problem is, and then they give you the what is worth to them to make that problem go away, then you'll come back into whether or not you could provide a solution that can help them get there within that price range. So is that kind of what you're telling us? Yeah. And I think in your profession, I think you should probably have, you should have packaged, uh, packaged services. The prices can change depending on the size of the client or other variables that are other variables that might be a surrogate for the value to be created here, but you would have a basic package. This is the cheapest we can do. And let's just use tax returns. I just do the return and it's X and the middle package is you could. So how, how can you add value? X plus consultation. You have questions? Like I I have questions for my accountant or my wife and business partner does and we call the accountant and like we get the questions answered and then a bill bill shows up and it's like, well, what? Oh, we always pay it, but it's annoying as hell. We never know, like they don't articulate to us, like at no point have they ever articulated this is how the relationship works. We just get these bills in the mail. There's an opportunity to actually, for them to extract more money from us <clears throat> to pay a uh, for like a, a larger sum of money up front or even monthly for just some ongoing consultation where we don't feel guilty about calling and they don't feel guilty about sending the invoice. And then the anchor option is you think of the anchor option, the most expensive one would be customized, something quite elaborate, customized to that client situation. So think of it as um, um, basic, enhanced, and then customized. That's a good way to think of three options for the accounting profession. That's a perfect way to end it. Blair, thank you so much. We're on top of the hour. It's a pleasure and an honor to have you. I'm going to speak in behalf of the entire profession. And yes, I have given myself the title and the authority to do that. So in behalf of the entire profession, we love what you got to say. We would love to learn more about uh, what you um, what you could provide for us. And then we'll see you next time. So I know you got to log off. Thank you very much, Blair. Yeah. appreciate it. Thanks, Hector. Bye-bye. Okay, so Blair stepping out. I just want to do a couple of things here. So one, um, I was hoping that maybe we could talk a little bit about a couple of episodes from his podcast. Um, so I'll just mention them really quick. One is called Just Stop Talking. This one just came out. And honestly, I think it's one of the best podcast episodes I have ever heard. 
go listen to it. And it talks about why we talk so much, why we oversell, why we feel the need to fill the void or a blank space where you're just allowing the customer to think about the solutions. It's called Just Stop Talking. Check it out, the Two Bobs podcast. He's got another awesome episode called um, something about pro bono. I call it strategic pro bono, which is in what situations pro bono makes sense and how can pro bono be a net good thing that your, uh, that your uh, uh, firm does. And a whole bunch of episodes on scope creep and having conversations about scope creep. Um, uh, Blair Enns is absolutely fantastic. He coined a, a, a concept called the inefficiency principle, which basically means that you can either be innovative or efficient, but the two things are pinned against each other, right? Being efficient is not being innovative. That's, that means doing it the only way you know how to do it and try to do it as quick as possible. And being innovative means experiment, do it different, look for a different solution, think outside the box, stop and think. And as accountants, we focus way too much on efficiency, way too little in, in, in innovation. And until we understand that these two things are pinned against each other and we are comfortable with being innovative, even at the peril of being inefficient, then we're going to evolve and then we're going to go to, we're going to evolve ourselves into the next level. So if you're not already signed up to come to our conference in, in, in Hollywood, Florida, it's called the Reframe Conference called Influential Conversations for Accountants. I take a little bit from Blair. I take a little bit from Ron Baker, from all the people that I admire that have learned over the years. And we built a conference around this, about how, how to have better, more effective conversations with our clients, employees, our coworkers, software companies, whatever. Uh, the original date that we had set was the third week of October. We're going through some date changes. The dates might change to October 16th to 19th. It's not official yet, but you will get an email if you already signed up for the conference for that official uh, change. The conference ticket is $1,800. $1, there are four coupon codes. One expires April, the other one May, uh, uh, June, and July because we had this date change. We had to redo the coupon codes. So uh, you can sign up for this conference for now if you're available either October 16th to 19th or October 24th to 26th, the original dates. Uh, sign up for the conference and we'll let you know very, very soon what those dates are. www.reframe2024.com. I'll give you my personal guarantee. It will be the best conference you'll ever go in, you'll ever go to. www.reframe2024.com. Thank you very much, guys. And we'll see you next month for episode four of the Influential Conversations for Accountants mini series. Goodbye.